Did Black Panther Wakanda Forever give a loving and powerful tribute to Chadwick Boseman? Absolutely. Was it as good as the first movie? Not really. The original Black Panther was a smash hit in 2018. It made a strong cultural impact, grossed well over a billion dollars, and was even nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars, which is unheard of for a comic book movie. I can think of at least one other comic book movie that should have been nominated, but don't even get me started on that. Chadwick Boseman owned the role of T'Challa, and his tragic passing quickly changed the course of the franchise. Director and screenwriter Ryan Coogler said that working on this film without Boseman was the hardest thing he'd ever done in his career, adding that Boseman was the one who held together the first film. Although the sequel has an incredibly talented cast, Chadwick Boseman's absence is really felt here. Let's start with what I liked about Wakanda Forever. As I already mentioned, they give a beautiful tribute to Bozeman in the beginning by giving the character of T'Challa a dignified send-off. This scene also introduces the character arc for Princess Shuri, played by Letitia Wright. Shuri is T'Challa's younger sister, who tries and fails to create a healing herb just before his death. Shuri played a supporting role in the original, and was mainly the character who provided the gadgets and the comic relief. In this one, she's the main character, and Letitia Wright really steps up her game with a strong and emotional performance. It was nice to see a more serious and sometimes even dark side to Shuri. No more moments like the original when she yells, What are those? Angela Bassett absolutely nails it. She's always been a consistently great actress, and this might be the most powerful performance of her career. The relationship between her and Shuri is nice too. While the original Black Panther dealt with fathers and sons, this time, it's the mother-daughter relationship that's the heart of this movie. Winston Duke is awesome as M'Baku. The guy has such a great screen presence, and his character serves as a nice addition to Wakandan political discussions. While he respects the throne, he's also not afraid to challenge the queen's opinions. And it's also hilarious to see this guy who's built like a tank munching on a carrot stick. You bald-headed demon is probably the best line in this movie. This movie does have some problems. Namor, the film's antagonist, isn't bad. He just doesn't make as much of an impact as Eric Killmonger in the first movie. Killmonger's motivations are slowly revealed in a clever and efficient way, and he's shown to have a deeply personal connection to T'Challa. Namor's motivations are explained in a long flashback info dump. He also doesn't have that personal connection with Shuri the way Killmonger did with T'Challa. Not to mention, Michael B. Jordan was a much more intimidating and charismatic presence. Nothing against Tenoch Huerta, but Jordan is a really tough act to follow. The movie is also very long. It clocks in at 2 hours and 41 minutes, but it really didn't need to be that long. A lot of the scenes linger, particularly in the second act. There's also a lot of unnecessary plot points. I love Martin Freeman, but his character ultimately didn't have a major impact on this story. They also keep referring to him as colonizer simply because he's a white dude? I guess that's supposed to be funny? I don't know. And then there's Riri Williams, also known as Ironheart. She's a 19-year-old MIT student who can build Iron Man suits because, well, she's just wicked smart. Dominique Thorne does fine, but Riri Williams as a whole just doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the movie. Between the immature humor, the fast-paced quippy dialogue, and the Power Rangers looking suit, she comes across like a character from a Disney Plus series. Riri's character is written primarily to be a plot device. Namor sees her as a threat to his underwater kingdom because her machine detects vibranium. He believes killing her is the only way to protect his kingdom's location, even though the CIA would have already had that marked, so killing Ruri really does nothing. Not to mention, Namor even admits that there might be other scientists who could build a similar machine, so there's really no reason to threaten Wakanda with violence over her. And taking away this plot point could have cut down the movie's runtime by a lot. There are plenty of more efficient ways the script could have introduced conflict between Namor and Wakanda, and a long detour that involves the good guys kidnapping a college student just isn't it. How does Wakanda Forever rank in Phase 4 of the MCU? I'd put it in third place, just behind Shang-Chi and way behind No Way Home. Overall, it has some good moments and performances, but the plot was long-winded and convoluted at times, and I prefer the simplicity and personal stakes of the original. If you like this video, please hit like and subscribe, and I'll be bringing more content. Thanks for watching, and I hope you all have a good one.